Hello, I'm Julie Levitt Learson, and this is my lecture for Honors 1101, What We Leave Behind, Fashions of the Edwardian and Great War Eras 1900 to 1920. It's a pretty awkward title for this lecture. Um, these two short decades um, are kind of the in-between time, a post-Victorian era and pre, you know, really true modern age. There are lots of terms for these decades that kind of slip and slide around. Um, people oftentimes refer to La Belle Epoque, which is roughly from the 1880s to 1914. That would be speaking about culture in France. Um, in America, we often refer to this era between like 1896 and 1914 as the progressive era. If we um, go back in time a little bit, 1877 to 1896, we call that the Gilded Age. So there's some slippage there. Um, but basically, for these first couple of decades, we've got this time of, of pretty good economic prosperity with lots of disposable income for many rising bourgeoisie family in Europe and America, a general feeling of optimism that's very pro-technology, pro-science, pro-industry, um, and a flourishing of arts and culture that is becoming increasingly accessible to all segments of society. So most of these names for, for these decades were coined, you know, well after the fact, especially once we all got through World War One and we're kind of looking back. But um, there is one name that I haven't mentioned yet that actually kind of fits neatly in here. And that's the Edwardian era, so called because in early 1901, the long reigning Queen Victoria died and her son, Edward, became King Edward VII of England. Here he is on his coronation day with his wife, Queen Alexandra, uh, and he reigned until his death in 1910 because, of course, um, Queen Victoria had had lived quite a long time. And so Edward was you know, well into middle age by the time he ascended the throne. So his reign was short, but he kind of left his stamp on that first decade of the 20th century. He was worldly. He was urbane. He was sociable. He was... A, fall, a, a maker of fashion trends um, in kind of stark contrast to his mother, who was pretty reclusive after her husband died. Um, and so he had this kind of like sense of ease and, and that kind of carried over to society at large that sort of felt they had been on their best behavior for decades. Um, so that was going on in England. In France, there was relative political stability with a great degree of kind of personal freedom in society. And it was so Paris became a great place for artists and writers and innovators of all kinds to kind of flock to and flourish. Um, and in 1900, the Universal Exhibition in Paris featured the electric light, which gave the moniker City of Lights to Paris. Um, and as we've been looking at with our readings, um, you know, Germany's united. It's kind of flexing its muscles under Kaiser Wilhelm, who is Edward VII's cousin. Uh, in America, we have general prosperity, um, with the exception of farmers um, and people of color who are all still generally having a hard time. And in Russia, there's growing unrest amongst the underclass that's going to um, lead to serious consequences for the czar. I'm going to be focusing mostly on women's wear for this lecture. You'll see once we get to the men's wear why. Um, but during these two decades, um, we have four basic silhouettes. From 1900 to about 1908 or so, we have the Edwardian silhouette, right? Uh, King Edward reigns until 1910, um, but fashion kind of jumps before he goes into the next phase. So um, 19th century beauty standards still really apply. It's kind of a continuation of that look that we were just looking at last lecture. Um, we have an Art Nouveau influence that I'll get into in a few minutes. Um, but by about 1910 to 1914, we have something called the Ampere Revival, which is um, hopefully you can tell looking at this slide, a rather dramatic change in the fashionable silhouette. Um, and so it's it's a change from the skin out. Then from 1914 to 1918 or so, we have World War I, um, and fashion is rather deeply impacted by all kinds of disruptions in trade and a change in mindset and lack of access um, to markets and, you know, lack of anywhere to go during war in Europe um, and, and lack of interest in following fashion when there are bigger problems to consider. Then from 18, 1918 to 1920, we're kind of in a, in a 
period of transition, trying to get our feet back under ourselves and, and figure things out, coping uh, with life after a global war and the psychic as well as the physical and economic trauma that's going to play out. But let's start with our Edwardian and kind of Art Nouveau era, these first you know, eight to 10 years of the new century. And we are continuing with uh, the Gibson girl. We mentioned her in the last lecture. The Gibson girl was this, this advertising illustration figure developed by American artist Charles Dana Gibson. She was introduced in the 1890s, so that era with the big poofy sleeves that we were looking at last time in the bell skirts, right? She was the symbol of this emerging new feminine ideal. She was strong, independent, healthy, and fit. So she was sporty and fashionable. Gibson Girl continued to be popular into the first decade of the new century, but she's a little bit more mature, a little bit more worldly, a little bit more voluptuously curvy. Um, and what I have here are images of three real live women who uh, came to be kind of symbolized as the, the living representations of the Gibson Girl. Nancy Longhorn, who marries a British lord and becomes Lady Astor. Evelyn Nesbitt, who's an American actress, and Camille Clifford, who um, I believe was British uh, and, and got picked out um, from a competition to be kind of the living Gibson girl. So as you can see with that illustration in the top corner, they do rather look like that illustration. So what was the secret to this new sexier Gibson girl look? Well, it's underwear. We have that hourglass shape, but as you can see from this uh, Coronet Corset Company advertising illustration on the left-hand side here from 1900, that hourglass shape is uh, undergoing a bit of a twist or rather a bend. You can see this on the illustration to the right as well. This new style corset that they're calling the straight front corset um, is changing the woman's silhouette. You can see the on both of these images, the figure on the left is rather rectilinear, straight up and down. And as these artists are suggesting, kind of boring and passe. Whereas the figure on the right of each of these illustrations, she's kind of willowy, she's curvaceous, she's um, kind of nubile and bendy, and there's something very attractive and intriguing about that. <clears throat> and that is due to the new shape that this corset is making. So even though it's called the straight front corset, the shape that it creates is called the S-bend, because as you saw from those illustrations, when a woman stands to the side in this corset, her silhouette makes the shape of the letter S. Her chest sticks out in front of her, um, and then her, her rear end kind of sticks out behind her, so she becomes an S-curve. Um, so with this corset, which you can see here, the bosom is uncovered. It's really more like the corset is supporting underneath the bosom to lift it up and out. And then it's called a flat front design um, because the idea is, is that the body forms a straight line from the bosom down. And that straight line is, is kind of from the bosom. So it pushes the hips backwards. Um, and as you can see from these images, the boning of the corset continues down over the hips. So it's really kind of shaping the hips and the rear end, as well as the bosom and the waist. And it's really rather severely uh, laced at the waist. This is the era of the tightest lacing. Um, and the tiny waist is a very fashionable shape. And this is really the only time where the corset is really forcing a tiny, tiny waist for the most fashionable women. Obviously, more practical-minded women kind of modify this. Other thing to mention here is that bust improvers, if you remember from the last lecture, and hip padding, as well as dramatic posing for photos, kind of finish creating this illusion. If you look back at the illustrations, um, which of course aren't real women, right, but illustrations on the previous slide, and you could like stand up and try to do this yourself, right? But if you stick your chest forward and kind of purposefully curve your spine back and stick your bottom out, you can achieve something like this S-bend shape for a moment. It's going to suck to maintain that posture all day long. You can't really do it, but you can do it while you're posing for a photo, right? So there you go. And here are the rest of 
typical Edwardian underpinnings, right? Underneath you have the corset, you have your camisole and probably your bust improvers and your hip pads. You have a short petticoat or short um, drawers, which would be wide legged um, pants for underwear that go down to the knee. And the corset has uh, garters attached to it at the bottom in the front and the back that you will then attach to your stockings to hold them in place. And then over this, you're going to have a long petticoat and a corset cover. And that corset cover might have a little frill of lace at the bust to create that fashionable powder pigeon silhouette, pushing the illusion of that bendy S-curve even further. And then, of course, once you have all of those underpinnings on and in place, then you put your gown or your walking suit on and you leave the house. Um, fashion designers by this point had set up shops and showrooms in Paris. Um, Charles Frederick Worth, Paul, Paul Poiret, Anna Packin, the Cayo sisters, and several others um, were doing this. And so women would come to them to have them create so-called one-of-a-kind gowns and suits for them. If you didn't have the money to commission a bespoke outfit, also new to this era are department stores. There's Harrods and Selfridges in England. There's Neiman Marcus and Marshall Fields and Filene's in America and lots others elsewhere as well. Department stores aren't designer wear, but they often copy designer looks from uh, these bespoke places or from fashion magazines and then sold more affordable off the rack kind of knockoff versions um, to customers who couldn't afford bespoke wear. Um, and women would often kind of smuggle designer looks home after traveling overseas to sell for copying um, and because there were limits on how many things women could buy and you pay tax on and they would they would smuggle dresses and things like that into their trunks so that they could sell them to department stores um, and other uh, trades people to recreate designer looks. And of course we have our catalog Sears, Montgomery Wards, etc. Um, where they're copying or modifying down um, kind of the haute couture styles for middle class and lower income shoppers. And so here is that S Bend silhouette in action with daywear. You can see um, dresses and suits still very much the thing, but you can see a difference not only in the shape of these garments, but the texture of the fabrics and the way the trimmings are being done, etc. Right in general, in this era, fabric is light and fluttery. Uh, they tended to favor light pastel colors. This is called the mauve decade, um, and there's lots of lace and frilliness involved. You can see the bishop sleeve in that dress on the right. That's uh, you know a sleeve that's really full and it's even kind of fuller towards the back of the arm than the front. And then you catch it in a narrow cuff at the wrist. Uh, you can see that powder pigeon bosom where that S curve really sticks the bosom out in front of you. Um, and then the skirt is called a trumpet skirt because it fits nice and smooth over the hips, over that padded corset, and then flares out kind of below the knee in really soft and graceful folds. So it's really light and flowy and kind of fluffy. And with that walking suit on the left, she's got a bolero jacket, you know, a short jacket and a blouse. And then her trumpet skirt, the bolero jacket has some bishop-like sleeves. Um, and you can see the blouse is tucked into a really wide cinched belt to show off that narrow waist all the more. So the bolero jacket is kind of helping create that illusion of a smaller waist by creating a wider um, torso. Some images of some more day wear. On the left is a day dress. Um, it's American and it's it's pretty light and lacy again. It's got this beautiful cutwork lace with flowers and birds and leaves all over. It's just lovely. This is called a lingerie dress, light cotton fabric with lots of lace and ribbon detail, um, so-called because it's it's as light and airy as lingerie. It's, 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 you know, think back to like that chemise de la reine from uh, the late 1700s. It's that same kind of idea, but now it's very respectable. On the right-hand side, we have, you know, a shirt waist, blouse, and skirt. So there's another option for day wear. And you can see this beautiful kind of undulating, natural form um, uh, design on the skirt there. That's very Art Nouveau. It's, it's this 
you know, rejection of rigid lines and, um, you know, geometric shapes. And it's really just this undulating, curvy, graceful, willowy, meandering kind of motif. The walking suit is still popular. Again, you can see that short jacket paired with a, a trumpet skirt. There's a little bit of train on the back of these. Some very um, detailed trimming on these. You can see again more of that Art Nouveau undulating trim on that blue suit on the right. Um, these were also called tailor-made suits because they were very interested in um, you know, getting that close fit to the body. But of course, it's a very different kind of tailoring than what we saw, say, in the 1870s, where you were basically turning the body into a carapace, you know. Um, these outfits often could be ready to wear, and you just pair them with your shirtwaist, which were also often ready to wear manufactured in factories. And the idea was that you just kind of like made your body fit the shirtwaist, right, um, within, you know, a certain range of size. Outerwear. So on the left, we have a tailored coat um, that's generally following the lines of the body, rather lovely. I love the asymmetrical buttoning on it. And then on the right, we have a coat that is designed specifically for riding in an automobile called a duster. It is in tan, washable fabric um, for reasons because it's going to be washable when it gets all the dust on it. And the tan color is going to hide dust well until you can wash it. You can see she's wearing goggles as well. It's because early automobiles did not have an enclosed passenger cabin. And so the goggles kept the dust out of her eyes. And then a big wide brimmed hat with a veil so that she can keep the dust out of her face and hair. Now this wide brimmed hat is really um, a, an iconic signature accessory of this decade. These are called picture hats. So they've got a wide brim, a low crown, and lavish decoration, flowers, feathers, ribbons, birds, you name it all over it. Fruit, you got it. Um, it's called a picture hat, we think, because the hat is framing the face, creating a very picturesque look. Um, these hats, as you can see here, are often perched on the hair rather than fitting around the top of your skull. And so they were held in place with hat pins. And I've got a collection of hat pins, uh, vintage ones there on the lower left-hand corner. And then a lovely uh, illustration of a Gibson girl putting on her hat with hat pins. And as you can see, they're quite large. And there are lots of newspaper stories from this era of women on train cars or women in um, th on the street who were attacked by lascivious men and women defended themselves by removing a hat pin from their hat and stabbing men with them. I don't know how often this story actually turned out to be true, but I like to think of kind of uh, Gibson girl power. Now for evening, we see the continuation of that S Ben silhouette and again, more light and fluttery fabrics um, with these evening dresses here. Again, lots of light pastel colors um, or this kind of golden color that um, when the ballroom was lit up with gaslight, they would just glow like like heavenly fire. And then on the right hand side, you can see, I, I just loved it so much. I gave you front view and back view. This is a couture, one of a kind gown by Worth, right around uh, 1902. And it's called the ironwork dress because these beautiful scroll works on it are kind of imitating the ironwork that was um, ornamenting Paris at the time. Um, think of like the metro stations and um, fire escapes and things like that. It was very artful, this, this practical um, architectural feature. And um, so it's kind of repeating here in this cut velvet on this dress. Very, very, very Art Nouveau. Uh, with your evening gown, you might want to wear a cape if it's chilly. And so this one here on the right hand side, just from about 1905, it's a satin cape with a lace overlay. Again, those undulating kind of vaguely floral forms um, with this kind of see-through quality to them quite lovely. On the left hand side here, this is Queen Maud of Norway, right around 1905, who was a fashion icon at this time. And she is wearing a very um, kind of it statement necklace for the decade. This is called a dog collar, or the French word for it is, is parure. 
um, which is one of the most difficult words I think to pronounce. Um, but it's several strands of pearls that are then arranged, you know, in a wide choker. I think she's got five strands there. So there might be separators of beads in between those strands to, to hold them um, correctly apart and spaced from each other. And then there might be um, clasped with a, a brooch with a big gem on it. Um, fashion was alleged to have been started by a uh, Queen Alexandra, uh, Edward VII's wife, um, because by the time she became queen, she was of a certain age and wanted to hide signs of age that were appearing in her neck. Um, you know, you can keep the sun off your face, you can dye your hair, you can put on a little makeup and powder, but once you reach a certain age, your neck looks your age. And so if you have this, this wide collar of jewels around your neck, no one's going to be able to tell. But of course, such luxuries were beyond the means of most women of this era. Here are a couple of middle class or possibly working class women um, on the streets of London. These are photos by Edward Lindley Sanborn, who just put his camera out on the streets in London uh, this happens to be 1906, and he would take photographs of everybody he saw who would walk by. So they're really lovely slice of life photos. So you can see they're wearing blouses paired with skirts, but the skirts here are much shorter and much plainer than those high fashion images we were just looking at. All right, you can see their feet, their ankles, and, and a couple of inches of their calves. So their skirts are going to stay out of the dirty, dusty streets. But even so, they've got kind of that modified S-bend silhouette, um, and they are wearing their version of the picture hat as they go on their way to work in a factory or maybe an office or maybe uh, a shop. This is, of course, um, the era of the triangle shirtwaist factory fire in America. And so young women were often um, put to work in factories making clothing that they could then either purchase themselves or um, making clothing that would be beyond their means to ever own. So that Gibson girl look, you know, first in the 1890s and then into the first decade of the 20th century is, is rather persistent. But by around 1910, we have this change because of course the fashion impulse is always desiring change. Um, and here we have it. So it's kind of a new twist on the Ampere style from about a hundred years ago. So it's called the M Ampere Revival look. And again, we have straightened the body up out of that S bend. Our skirts have slimmed down to be very narrow around the legs. And um, our posture has changed and we've gotten away from that kind of frilly, floaty, floppy look into something a little bit more tailored and uh, stiff. Um, you can see these wide collars, um, thicker fabrics, um, more geometric cuts, um, and a much more kind of uh, column-like shape. And so here are some Ampere Revival day dresses. If the last image was of walking suits, these are the day dresses. So you can see the body is turned into an elegant column. The fabric in the dresses is still kind of light and floaty, but now it's really clingy. Um, so not only has the silhouette become, you know, snugger around the body, but the kind of fabrics that are being used here um, are designed to cling to the woman's form and reveal her body, even as it's fully concealing it under fabric. So these dresses, which um, were like 1908 uh, and, and were worn to the races, they were rather scandalous. But of course, they took off and then everybody wanted to have some too. Uh, and this beautiful bright blue dress on the right-hand side, um, which is now housed in the Galleria del Costume di Palazzo Pitti. <laughs> um, it's a silk and wool dress. And as you can see, we're dealing with some asymmetry. We've got a hold over those bishop sleeves. There are a couple of nods here to some, I don't know, maybe ancient Greece or or the, the Greek revival style of a hundred years ago. Um, and you can kind of see it um, on the neckline there, there's a there's a little um, high-necked kind of underblouse. It's called a gimp, G-U-I-M-P-E. Um, 
but it's lace over net and it's made to both kind of, you know, conceal her neckline and shoulders, but, um, you know, give the appearance of something a little bit more scandalous. Of course, with a new silhouette, you need new foundations. So here are the Ampure Revival undergarments. You can see um, how the bodice, the the corset shape has changed again. It's still underneath the bust, but instead of instead of um, you know creating this sense of S bend, it's keeping the sense of a column. And then you can see something called a bust bodice that is actually holding the bosom in place, worn underneath this corset. Note how this corset still continues down, way down, far over the hips. Um, down to the to the thigh, um, which is going to impede movement a little bit, but you've got these narrower skirts, right? So the thinking is, well, you don't really have to move your legs apart all that far because you, your skirt's not gonna let you move either, right? And over here on the top hand right, you can see the slip that's covering all of this to make the nice smooth line for those clingy fabrics. And the slip is very, very close to the body as well. And of course, if you're not feeling all that scandalous, this fashionable silhouette can be modified. The left-hand side is a page from a 1910 Sears and Roebuck catalog. On the right-hand side is a blouse and skirt from 1912 at the Victoria and Albert Museum. But you can see, right, it's a column. Um, we're, we're kind of shifting those shapes a little bit. Um, the colors are darker. Um, Fabrics are sturdier in the case of this suit that's probably for, you know, this skirt that's probably for, you know, day wear could be worn to an office job if you like, even though that blouse is rather fluttery, right? Um, and this kind of sense of asymmetry and off to one side and, and creating these little details that aren't those gorgeous, curvy, undulating shapes from the Art Nouveau, but are a little bit more um, geometric and rectilinear. In terms of evening wear, that clingy silhouette continues. Um, fabrics are light and they're often sheer. And um, the sheer layer sometimes goes over a brighter opaque underlayer. You can see that in this dress here on the right, which looks like a teal or a green. And then you have this really sheer black net or chiffon over it. So it's quite lovely layering effect and you're gonna kind of shimmer as you move in this dress. Um, you can see bold color contrast set off by metallic lace. There's also a lot of beading and embroidery and fringe here in these, in these looks. You can see that in both of these images here. And this is also a time where designers are once again, looking towards the Middle East and towards Asia and really kind of, um, pulling motifs and styles from those places and mashing them up with European sensibilities. So we have exoticism and oriental, orientalism. And the French designer Paul Poiret um, is kind of famous for this. These are some of his designs here. This is an illustration from a fashion magazine and then um, the actual dress made to look like it. So you can see um, how that works there. Um, and then here on the top right hand side is a photo of it. She's an actress, Germaine Yvonne Ardenot from 1913. She's got this bandeau with, with a plume of feathers in it, sort of harkening back to that, um, you know, kind of Persian um, Arabian Nights kind of idea. Bottom right hand corner is this, her hair is up in a knot. And then she has a wide bandeau of fabric that is that is held in place with these kind of big jeweled clips, kind of a new take on that Greek bandeau. And Paul Poiret was kind of the it designer during this decade. Um, and he was very theatrical. He was very exciting. He was rather scandalous. Um, and here are a couple of his signature looks. On the left-hand side, he um, brought harem pants, which are a North African, Middle Eastern um, garment. Um, you know, places like Morocco, it would be very common for women to wear pants like this. They wouldn't call them harem pants, but to Europeans, that's what they call them. So he um, incorporated them into women's wear here. So these big balloony pants that, that then get caught at the ankle. So that was one look. Um, and then the other one he did was the hobble skirt. You can see that here. So that skirt, like you were seeing in those earlier images, quite narrow silhouette. But then he would do things 
to to either sew the silhouette so that it was really tight, really forcing you to take very small steps, or add things like ribbon trim around the back of the hem so that you literally cannot spread your legs to take a full stride. Poiré famously said that he freed women's bodies from the constraints of the corset. He said, I freed the bosom and I imprisoned the legs. I'm not sure we should thank him for that, but it was a trend. Another designer working at this time is the Italian designer Mario Fortuni, and he claimed to have found the secret method of the ancient Greek drapery style. If you think all the way back to the beginning of the semester when we were looking at the classical statues and how we had that kind of wet drapery look on the statues, Fortuny says he's discovered their secret and has developed this pleating method. So all of these dresses here are Fortuny gowns. He called them the Delphos gown, um, kind of recreating that Greek goddess look. Um, and it's, it's very fine silk that has been pleated within an inch of its life so that when you wear it, it just falls in these beautiful, graceful folds and yet conforms to your body at the same time. And people just thought it was magical and amazing. You can see here, these are five gowns in the New York Mets collection. Each gown was truly individual. They were all different um, variations on a theme. And uh, since he died, his secret seems to have died with him, although we do still continue to work on it. A female client once asked him, well, my goodness, what do I wear underneath this gown? Thinking like, you know, what kind of petticoat is gonna work with this? And he said to her, madam, nothing. So again, we're starting to reject that idea of corsetry. Here is another variation on that exoticism and orientalism. We've looked at kind of the Persian and Turkish influence, the Moroccan and North African influence, um, ancient Greek, and now we have the Japanese style, right? So again, looking at fabrics and silhouettes and design motifs from Japan and China and other East Asian um, countries and applying it to European styles of dress. So you might see an evening gown with kimono sleeves or wide sashes that are supposed to represent an obi or um, you know Asian print or um, stylized Asian design motifs like this kind of wave pattern here on the left or the flowers in the middle. And we see this play out also in outerwear, this cocoon coat and kimono wrap, which aren't really <laughs> true representations of Japanese or Chinese or Korean um, garments, but they're, you know, a Parisian designer's take on them. As the teens decade moves on, designers like Poiré, both of these are his designs here, he really starts to experiment with new shapes and forms. This dress on the right is called the sorbet gown and some people also call it the lampshade dress because as you can see, it's really kind of like two pieces. Uh, and there's, there's a stiffener in that bottom edge of that tunic to hold it away from the body. Um, He's experimenting with different styles of draping and different arrangements and layerings of fabric, and it's just all getting kind of forkata. And then all of that kind of gets interrupted by the so-called Great War, roughly 1913 to 1918. And of course, this being a global war that is wrecking just unprecedented destruction and havoc um, in virtually every corner of the planet. Um, fashion takes a, a sharp turn. Nobody really wants to be frivolous and adventurous anymore. Um, and uh, fashions become much more practical and sober. Um, lots of materials were commandeered for the war effort. And of course, trade lines and supply chains were absolutely disrupted by this. So also women were taking on support roles at home in factories and on farms and doing um, the home front war work. Um, and so that required some more practical clothing. So you can see here on the left is a walking suit from 1914. This is American um, from Jordan Marsh. On the right is a day dress um, from, I think, 1914 from the Victoria and Albert Museum. And then in the middle is something called a princess slip. So the corset cover and petticoat has become one garment. Um, and as you can see, the... Uh, 
hemlines on the skirts of both the suit and the dress have widened back out again. No more hobble skirts. My goodness, we have things to do. And so this princess slip has this you know, same uh, shape where it's narrow at the waist and then widens out at the hemline and has a little bit of a ruffle to help the dress hold its shape. So we have these suits here. These are roughly 1916, maybe 1917. Um, and so we've got kind of a, a full cut hip length jacket that's belted um, slightly above the natural waist. We've got kind of fullish skirts, but not full compared to, you know, even the Edwardian skirts of 1900, certainly not um, the skirts of the 1860s or 1880s or 1890s, right? Um, but full compared to a hobble skirt. Um, but the skirt is above the ankle, right? All of this is, we've got a little bit of fabric rationing going on here. Um, and so these kind of boxier shapes where we're kind of manipulating the silhouette through the careful placement of belts and folds um, is allowing us to get the most bang for our buck with these fabrics. You can see these wide collars, though are a little bit kind of mannish or militaristic, a little bit masculine. You can see the hats. Um, the lady there on the left has kind of like the last homage to the picture hat, but in general, the hats have gotten smaller and closer to the head and much less decorative. Dresses worn during the day, they're going to be very wash and go kind of fabrics. These, I think the one on the left is cotton. The one on the right might be cotton or it might be silk. Um, again, you see that silhouette, the raised waist, the fuller skirt. Um, some collars, a little bit of a masculine shape to those collars, these big pockets that look very practical, right? Um, and um, that well above the ankle hemline. And of course, we still have evening wear. So here are some evening gowns from the war years. Um, as you can see, they're a little bit simpler than those confections by Poiret and other designers from before the war. Um, and they are shorter, but they're still kind of playing around with waistline and hemline and asymmetry. You can kind of see both the fashion illustration in the middle and the photo on the right. Um, there's kind of like a high-low hem effect with this, not quite a train, right? Um, and then this this gown on the left-hand side, I do believe those hemlines are deliberately, you know, on a tilt like that. That's not just this is put on the form kind of slanty wise, I think that's deliberate. Um, so there's this kind of sense of like off balanceness that, that that the world is feeling. And even that is maybe playing out a little bit in the fashions here. And women's coats and hats for this era are definitely taking on a little bit more militaristic tone to them, right? Thick, heavy wool, high collars, um, covering up the neck, these hats that are really close to the head and have, you know, this single feather or big buttons on them. Um, that look rather similar to men's uniform hats. Let's spend a moment just to look at these images of some working women um, in the war effort. On the far left, we have a U.S. Army nurse in a suit. Above her, we have uh, a Canadian nurse from World War I who's in a gown with an apron. And then we have, on the right-hand side, two uh, women munitions workers from the U.K., and so one is wearing, you know, a quite short knee length dress with what looks like leggings almost, right? And then the one on the right, she's wearing um, a jacket and pants. So harem pants, you know, were, were Poiret's scandalous invention of the early teens. And some women are then kind of taking a much more practical approach and saying, if I'm doing a man's work, I think I need <laughs> clothes that function like a man's clothes that allow me to move about the factory floor without worrying about my skirt getting caught up in the machinery. Well, but eventually the war ends. And so here we are, a couple of looks from between 1918 and 1920. And I will say, like, this is not the prettiest era in these two years. It's all been kind of weird for a little bit, right? Um, it's a slimmer silhouette from that kind of, they called the war crinoline um, before with that kind of like barrel shape to the skirts. And now it's slimmed back down again. The waist has been raised up again, but now we've got these ruffles and flounces and tears of things is kind of like, self-conscious return to femininity after the war. These are, again, very light and gauzy fabrics compared to the wartime fabrics, which looked rather sturdy and practical 
um, and kind of make do. Um, and you can, again, see, right, lots of ruffles and ribbons, and there's a laciness to this, and then the hats are, you know, very feminine again as well. Um, but we're not going to stay with this look for long, so don't get comfortable here. So as you can see, women's wear underwent rather radical shifts in a very short period of time. Uh, men's wear, in contrast, much slower to change. Right here, I have an image of typical men's wear for almost every year of the first two decades. And there's not a huge change between their subtle differences, but not a whole lot, right? So let's take a slightly deeper dive. Men's formal day wear, following the same ideas from the last century, frock coats or cutaways with top hats during the day. Informal day wear or semi-formal day wear, the sack suit is here to stay. The bowler hat is being adopted as a less formal hat than a top hat. All right, there you go. And on the right, I've included a figure of a man in his own motoring coat to match the woman's duster from earlier in this slideshow. Separates in sportswear for casual dress. Um, we're starting to get this idea of wearing white during the summer and wearing darker colors during the cooler months. Um, but this idea that not everything has to be matchy matchy. Um, the straw boater is great for casual attire. We're liking mixing the patterns um, and colors, but everything is still kind of in those quiet, you know, neutral tones. Um, you can see the detachable collars with the young men on the left. You can see the variety in ties that they're wearing, sometimes quite narrow, sometimes quite wide, sometimes what we would call a foreign hand, typical necktie, and sometimes a bow tie. Um, very little jewelry, but we've got some watch fobs and watch chains here. And the hair is slicked down um, and, and parted on the side, kept off the forehead, and very little facial hair in evidence. So sportswear, if you're going hunting or shooting, is still going to be those Norfolks and Knickerbockers. Um, Edward VII loved the Norfolk jacket, loved his Knickerbockers, and so, of course, everyone is going to follow suit. Jumping ahead to 1910, we're looking at evening wear here. Again, tailcoat is considered the formal dress. Um, tuxedo for less formal evening wear, particularly in America. It's slower to be adapted in Britain and Europe. Um, you can see the man there on the left is in a frock coat for day wear, um, but not much is changing here. Here's some working men's wear. We've got French laborers from 1905 on the left. I just love this photo with their sack coats um, that are you know, rather less tightly um, constructed and their soft caps. And on the right hand side, we have some Oklahoman laborers from about 1914, um, looking more like traditional men's suits, but again, kind of baggy and soft and, and well worn. But for the very fashionable man, by about 1910, we're starting to see a slightly slimmer, more form fitting silhouette. You can see the waistline is raised high above the natural waist to like right under the ribs. And you can see in the illustration on the left, as well as in this example um, of existing um, period garment on the right, there is a back belt that is kind of like the Norfolk jacket kind of now entering mainstream fashion wear. But this back belt allows you to kind of um, cinch the back of that coat tighter to the body to show off the slimmer waist. So there's a little bit of padding in the shoulders to widen the shoulders to help create that kind of slight hourglass effect here. I just adore these patches of pockets on the outside. Look at the cufflinks on his shirt. Um, the vest is still there. Button fly on the trousers. Um, and oh my goodness, look at the purple and black stripe lining on that jacket. Wow. Underneath that suit coat, you can see men's shirts are now buttoning all the way down the front. They're going to wear solid colors or stripes. Um, collars may be manufactured as part of the shirt um, attached to it. And so one garment, or you might still have the detachable collar. Um, vests are still considered a necessary part of a man's suit. Now they're going to typically match the jacket and pants instead of be um, all different things. 
As you can see from this fashion illustration, um, vests are pretty form-fitting. They've got a variety of shapes and collar and pocket details. Men's pants, they're a little bit loose through the hip and thigh and then narrow at the ankle with a high defined waist and they're gonna be held in place with suspenders. Of course, many men were conscripted into the war effort and spent quite a bit of time ver wearing various uniforms through the 19 teens. And one garment from the war that made its way into civilian dress was the trench coat. Um, it was very practical and durable for war efforts and men liked it so much it became their garment of choice um, for outerwear when the war was over. Another item that was kind of a, a holdover from World War I that made its way into civilian fashion, you can't see it here, but the wristwatch. The wristwatch was kind of the iPhone of World War I. It was you know, developed so that men in the trenches could tell time to better coordinate their movements with each other and things like that. And um, men continued to wear them after the war was over. My last slide of this lecture on the left-hand side, you can see New York fashions from 1919, that uh, kind of nipped in waist, high-waisted silhouette, trim, legged trousers, slightly wide shoulders. Um, New York has maybe given Paris a run for its money because during the war, Paris and London couldn't manufacture. Um, garments and churn out designs, um, but America, because we were separated by an ocean, were free to continue um, as best we could. And we had rather abundant resources here being a large nation um, that didn't have to share borders with many other nations. So New York designers are starting to kind of make their presence known. And here we are heading towards a new masculinity, a new femininity, and big changes are coming.